There you go. Okay. So when Kelly first asked Becky and I to do this talk, when Becky and I talked about it, um, we decided we really wanted to try to put together something practical that would give you some of our favorite tips and strategies that we have, uh, in collaboration with our patients, figured out to help manage brain injury. So a lot of these are tried and true uh, remedies that our patients have used and given us feedback and that we like, um, and we try to keep it as practical as possible. So what we're going to talk about today is we're going to just look a little bit about the brain and how it works and how it's organized. We're going to talk a little, just a little bit about who's at risk for persistent symptoms. So why do some people recover well from a concussion or brain injury and why do some people end up with lingering symptoms? We're going to talk a little bit about the principles of neuroplasticity and that just means what, how do you get your brain to recover and change after an injury or even without an injury. Um, and then we'll sort of talk about some of the common symptoms and some of our strategies for management, um, as well as some strategies for return to work if some people are looking to do that. So if we start with how the brain works and what happens after the injury, this, <coughs> this is a picture of the brain. And the way the brain is organized is there's distinct areas of the brain that control distinct functions. So up here in the motor cortex of the blue, close to the yellow, that controls your motor movement, your legs, how your arms move. Those, that's the area of the brain. If you have damage there, it affects your ability to move your arm or your leg, depending where it is. The beginning at the frontal lobe is more your thinking skills. Can you mem where's your memory, problem solving, things like that. You have areas for speech. So if people have a stroke on a certain side, then they often lose their ability to talk and form words. So all of these areas are distinct within the brain. Um, and But the thing about the brain is that it's all organized together. So although there's distinct areas that control distinct things, there is some flexibility in the system. And the areas talk to one another. So even if you don't have a CT or MRI that shows damage in a specific area of the brain, you can still have difficulties with things because of how the brain all works together, right? When we talk about how the brain functions, we often talk about our higher level or our lower level processing symptoms or systems. So the cortex is the outside of your brain. And that is more your higher level thinking. So that is sort of the new part of the brain it's called. It's sort of because we're humans and we're supposed to be smart and evolved. That's sort of the cortex part that does a lot of those types of things. So it's your conscious part of your brain. You're thinking. Um, and because of that, it's the processing speed of that is slower. Um, but it's things like thinking, memory, movement, different things like that. The other part of your brain is your brain stem. And this is more your lower level processing system. And this is a very automatic. This is what controls your heart rate, your breathing, uh, your balance when you're walking. It's the reason why you don't have to, well, maybe until you had a brain injury, you can walk and talk and chew gum potentially without falling over, right? Where some of our patients have brain injury, that's hard to put all that together. This brainstem part of your brain, because it's automatic, is very fast with the processing speed. And if this part is working well, you feel comfortable with things. You can process sound. You can filter out light. You can maintain your balance. You can not hold your breath every time you do a task that requires effort. Um, so, but if you have damage to this part of your brain, it can affect things that you should do easily and automatically now become very effortful. Or uh, if it's not operating properly, then your cortex tries to take over, but that doesn't always go very well because that's a slower system, right? And it means that you can't now walk and hold a conversation, right? Because you're having to think too much about not falling over and judging your distance between objects, where normally you would do that without even worrying about it. What's newer in how we look at brain is called the connectome. And this is an image taken from what's a new imaging technique called diffuse tensor imaging, where instead of like an MRI where they look at the cortex and some of that matter, this looks at what's called the axons of the brain or the white matter of the brain. So this shows the, all the connections. So you can see all the different areas that connect from your left to your right. Um, the top part here is all the areas going to the cortex. Down here is more your brain stem from there. But you can see how rich the brain is in neurons, right? There's millions and millions of neurons that all connect. And it's often the connections between that gets disrupted after a traumatic brain injury. I pulled this picture off so you can see how integrated the 
the connections are within the brain. So you can imagine if someone has a hit to the head where they have a rotation or they go back and forth, if you have a rotation or have something like that, you can see how these fibers could potentially get damaged and be disrupted and that can affect how different areas are able to communicate with each other, right? So even though you people have been maybe sent for a CT or sent for an MRI and it's clear, which is good, we want them to be clear. There may be damage at this more microscopic level that you cannot see that will affect how the brain communicates and operates efficiently, right? Because often it's about efficient. Can you do things easily, right? Can you do things without being so tired? Can you do more than one thing at once? If we break things down a little bit further, this is what we would call it, this is the nerve cell. So this part is the cell body that initiates the electrical sig sig signal along the nerve. And nerve is your electrical system from your body, right? This is your electricity that sends out to tell things to do movements or breathe or whatever. Then what happens is you have a signal that goes along here and there is um, insulation along that nerve that helps the signal uh, pass by very quickly from one to the other. And then it, you have the end, right, or these um, dendrites at the end that will then potentially act on the next nerve because there's not one nerve from your brain all the way down to your toes. It would be a series of, of firing along a series of nerves from one part of the brain to the other. And if you look at the end, what happens is inside the end of those dendrites, you have chemicals called neurotransmitters that get released and then they have to pass through channels to go to the next cell in enough quantities that the next cell recognize it and can start the electrical chain going. So anywhere along some of those connections, you can have a failure of either not enough neurotransmitter, not the right neurotransmitter, or the channels are blocked, and so you lose some of the signal from one cell to the other, okay? So if you think about all the different ways your brains work, there's lots of ways for things to go wrong after you have an injury or if you have a neurological disorder. In our program, we see, there's lots of, I've learned there's a lot of different ways that you can get a brain injury. Probably one of the most common ones that we see are people have falls um, in various different uh, ways. Fall and hit the back of the head is often a bad one. They strike their head on something when they fall. We see people who are assaulted. Uh, motor vehicle accidents is also a very common way to have a brain injury. Sports injury is also quite common, and that tends to... It, Although it's across the age spectrum, a lot of the sports injuries are kids, sort of in the, particularly in the 10 to 14 range. Uh, we have a lot of people get struck by objects, either, you know, the hood of their car coming down and hit their head. We had one lady got head butted by a buffalo at the, Rid at the Ridley Zoo. There's lots of really interesting ways that you can get a brain injury. Um, so it can make for some interesting stories. So any type of blow or hit that strikes the head, neck, or face can cause a brain injury, but you can also have hits, like if you think if anybody's watching hockey playoffs, if you see some of those um, hits where the body gets hit, the head might not get hit, but there's such a force they don't, rec they don't anticipate it, they have that rotation force through their head that their brain can get rattled around in there as well. This is a nice, oh, okay, can you tell me to stop?
Okay. So I put this one on here because it shows the impact of the brain is at the front where his hand hits it. But you can see the brain move around and you actually can see the brain actually hit the back of the skull. So this is the other thing. So to, even if the, it, the, where you hit the brain might be at the back or the front or the side, the brain, because it's floating inside your skull, can move around and you have, it hits the inside of the skull and can cause damage in other places. So you can see this sort of the brain is not a hard and fast structure, so there's different ways that it can get damage from the impact. This, the fancy term for this is called a coup contra coup, which is in French where basically you hit one side and you have damage on the other side. After the injury, even though nothing may show up on a CT or an MRI, you have what happens is this chemical reaction that happens in your brain where because you're injured, you have less blood flow to the tissues that you need and you have less what's called glutamate or, or pardon me, glucose, which is the food for your brain. So you have this period of time for seven to 10 days where when you need to use your brain and your brain's not working as well because it's injured, you have less fuel and less blood flow available, which is why the advice that people often get after they have a brain injury is rest initially. We want the brain to rest for the first couple of days to make sure that they can settle down some of this neurochemical piece and let things settle down so you can get a little bit better. So this is sort of done more from animal research. So they think it takes about seven to 10 days, but maybe even longer for some of this brain chemistry to return to normal. When we're talking about why some people have persistent symptoms after, there's a few different factors, but one of the things they think that happens is that it's this network connectivity, right? The axons are damaged, the brain doesn't communicate as well with each other for different parts to each other, so then it's not a nice, efficient brain anymore. So when you do something, I often say to my patients before, if, um, you know, reading something and remembering what you read took 30% of your brain, now it might take 60% of your brain. So you get tired, you get a headache. And we see that from some of the studies that look at things like a functional MRI. So this is a, not just a regular MRI. They put patients in an MRI. They have them do a task, and they look at the amount of activity, and they can see the changes in blood flow. So this brain here on the left is without an injury, and you can see how much of the brain is lit up when they're doing a, a mental subtraction task, right? Compared to the brain on the, the brains on the right, where after they have an injury, you can see how much more of the brain is working to do the exact same task, right? So no wonder survivors have headaches when they do things. No wonder they get tired. No wonder you can't multitask or filter out noise, right? Because your brain is working much harder and less efficiently than it was prior to the injury. This is another uh, same idea, but this time instead of a, should I just keep talking? Mm -hmm. So this time instead of a uh, cognitive task, it's more a motor task. And so the brain on the left, it's just a right finger sequencing. So one part of your body moving and doing a sequence that's been asked. And you can see not very much of the motor planning part is involved for that task prior to the injury. But after the injury, there's way, again, way more of the brain lit up. So good job, Kelly. You're going to have to show me how to do that after. Um, so it's no wonder many of our patients struggle to do co more complex motor tasks. So I think and often think of, um, you know, high school students having to walk down a set of stairs when there's a whole bunch of people on the stairs that are walking up or down. They have to navigate down and can keep their balance and judge the stairs and not hit anybody else. Maybe they're having a conversation. It's no wonder they're anxious when they go up or down the stairs or have trouble with that. Now the only thing is this is on it on the now. The uh, bar is on there now. Okay. So what happens when you have this noisy, inefficient brain? It means it's hard for you to filter out sensory stimulus. It means you can't easily maintain your balance and move through your environment, it, like the stair example I just gave you. And it's hard for you to use multiple systems at the same time. So for example, if we, I have a lot of patients, if I'm having them do a visual task where they have to use their vision system or move their eyes, and I ask, put them in a position where they have to balance, they really struggle with it. They can maybe do just a balance task or just a vision task, but when I put the two together, they start to have difficulty. Either they can't perform the task very well or it causes symptoms for them. So who is more likely to be at risk of having persistent symptoms after brain injury? 
Well, it's not a very simple answer to this question. Uh, and a lot of it is who you bring to the injury, right? What, are, what, ha what, what makes you who you are before you have an injury? It can be things like, have you had a history of a brain injury in the past? And we always say the number one rule of brain injury is don't get another brain injury because you're less likely to have as good a recovery after you have one or more injuries than you are um, if you have no history of brain injury. So, but that's not the only factor. Uh, if you're female, you tend to have a higher risk of developing persistent symptoms after a concussion or mild traumatic brain injury. And they don't really know why that is. Um, there's a few theories that they're proposing. Things like neck strength means that their brain gets shook up a bit more. Um, things like, depending on where in your cycle you get your menstrual cycle, you get your injury can um, affect, the hormones can affect how your brain handles that type of injury. Um, and also, uh, I just learned actually at the last conference I was at that brain, female um, brain cells are injured at lesser forces than male. Brain injury. So we may just be more sensitive to the forces in a brain injury as well. Um, your age, so younger kids uh, tend to do better than teenage kids. Um, if you're a teenage female, you're high, definitely at a higher risk just by being in that age bracket of having persistent symptoms, as well as older people um, who are more less likely to have as good a recovery as sort of your kids in your 20s and things like that. Older is not obviously my age, it would be even older than that. <laughs> if you have a history of anxiety or depression or any other mental health or brain disorders prior to the injury, you're maybe more likely developing persistent symptoms. Um, if you have a history of migraines, uh, you could be more at risk of developing headaches. And genetics, so there's certain things like there's um, certain genetic factors that put you at risk for developing um, persistent symptoms. Then there's some injury factors that may play a role in develop, saying whether you have persistent symptoms or not. And that will be how symptomatic are you after? Is it a bad brain injury that you're very symptomatic after? That potentially can predict that you're going to have problems. If you have a sleep disturbance, there's a lot more research coming out now. If you have a sleep disturbance after your injury, it's more likely to prolong your recovery. And so that's, we often recommend one of the things you get addressed right away is any sleep problems. Um, and this is one of the few areas there's actually some good research out there in. If you have other injuries, like if your neck is involved, so some people, the concussion settles down, but it's a neck problem that they're, that's causing their headaches. So they think it's more brain injury, but when you actually address what the underlying neck problem is, the headaches go away. So making sure that someone's had a look at that, particularly depending on how you hit, um, how you get your injury. If you have vision changes, that's more predictive of persistent symptoms. If you have dizziness, if you report changes in cognitive status, so if you have trouble with memory, attention, multitasking early on, that can predict a longer recovery. And mechanism of injury. So you can imagine if you get struck on the head by something versus if you're in a high-speed motor vehicle accident, that the forces there would be more involved and you'd be less like, more likely to have persistent symptoms after that. And post-injury, there can be some factors that influence. Um, so some of that might be initial management. Did you actually rest for a couple of days after your injury or did you like some of our patients go right back to work the next day because you have stuff to do and it's not convenient to have a brain injury? Um, depending on what your job is, so some jobs are really uh, more challenging. If you're in a noisy factory, um, teachers who have to stand in front under fluorescent lights and talk in a busy environment uh, for long periods of time. What's your lifestyle? If you're a single parent running kids around and you have little kids that need your help for everything, it's really tough to take the downtime that you need after the injury. Do you have access to care? Have you had good advice early on or have you had bad advice that maybe haven't, hasn't been the best? So sometimes that can influence it. And I would say home and work supports as well. So if you have a workplace that's uh, supportive of you having a graduated return to work or maybe making some adaptation to lighting or different things like that, we have better luck getting people back to work versus not. So, neuroplasticity. So this is how can you help the brain improve? Kelly, this is super annoying. Oh, that's better. Okay. So what is neuroplasticity? Neuroplasticity is changes in your brain as the result of learning or experience. So as you can imagine, there's a lot of neuroplasticity from birth till when you're in your 20s. There's a lot of brain development, a lot of change, a lot of learning. That's not to say that the hope is all gone for those of us who are 
out of our 20s now, you're, we know for sure that your brain still changes throughout the entire life cycle. They didn't used to think that was the case, but now we know for sure that it is. It's harder to change. It takes a bit more work, but you can definitely change it. We also know for sure that you can change your brain after an injury, right? Again, a lot of recovery takes place within the initial stages after the injury, but we certainly see people several years out that had made significant changes. Um, so you've got lots of room to change and do things, but there's some principles you have to follow in order to help your brain recover. And the first principle is what's called Hebb's Law, and that is the neurons that fire together wire together. So that means if every time you um, go out into a busy environment, you get super overwhelmed and anxious because you can't handle the noise or the visual stim, and you keep doing that all the time, you'll start to be anxious for that, right? That going outside becomes anxiety provoking, so you start to avoid that. And we see that a lot in people. Um, so you want to make sure that you're doing things that are promoting recovery as opposed to promoting maladaptive behavior, right? We see a lot of people that um, when they go to move, they're a bit dizzy, and they don't like that sensation, so they stop moving. And then they just become more dizzy because the other part of this is that neurons out of sync fail to link. So that means if you don't actually do things together, if you don't um, practice something, you will lose it, right? Um, or if you do things at the wrong time or do things that are together. So you want to not only um, try to practice good things, and we'll talk about some of the things that you can do, but you got to watch the maladaptive stuff that you do as well. It's a use it or lose it for your brain, right? And uh, this is a strong neuroplasticity principle. And like I said about the dizziness is if you stop moving because you're dizzy, if you only walk with your head down and you don't walk with your head up, you lose that ability to walk with your head up. So these are the types of things that you need to practice to help you recover. The other thing is you have to use it to improve it. So you have to challenge your brain to be able to do things that are hard for it in order to improve and change. And we'll talk about how you figure out the right level of challenge. Another principle is you have to be specific. So if you are having difficulty walking up and down stairs, if you just walk over ground, that's not going to necessarily, although it may help a bit, that's not really going to tackle your ability and improve your ability to walk up and down stairs. So if you're having trouble with something, you have to be specific in how you target an exercise or activity to help change and improve that. The other thing about our brain is that you cannot learn if you're not paying attention. So if you are not engaged in a task, if your mind is wandering, if you can't concentrate because your headache is too bad and you're still trying to learn something, you're not going to learn it, right? You have to be engaged. You have to be attending in order for the brain to actually learn something. And if you have kids, you probably already know that. The other thing is motivation equals success. And so we see this a lot in our patients where, um, you know, if you have – it's more than just the right attitude. If you can be upbeat and handle and be resilient for what comes your way and be motivated to do your activities and your exercises, even if they, you don't feel great about it, um, this is where you start to see change. And I always say there's two types of people. There's a continuum of people in the world. On one end is those that don't do their exercises that their physiotherapist gives them. And then the other end is the people that do do their exercises. And I can tell you, we always know if you've done your exercises. And the people that don't change in our stuff are the ones that don't do the work. So you have to do the work to be able to make the change. This is not a miracle that you'll just, if you rest, that you'll feel better and things will be all right again. You have to do some of the work to change. The other thing about motivation is if you have success at something that's motivating, you're more likely to want to try and do it again. And we often use the example of a social situation. So if you decide you're going to go to a restaurant and you decide to go to Jack Astor's on a Saturday night at 6 o'clock, I can guarantee you if that's your first restaurant experience after your injury, that's not going to go all that well. And how motivated are you going to be to try to go out and do a social activity at a restaurant again? You're going to be nervous and scared because it will be an epic fail, likely. But if you decide you're going to go, especially now that the weather is better, I'm going to go sit on a patio, I'm going to go at 2 in the afternoon, I'm going to have a coffee with one of my friends, 
you might walk away from that after an hour and a half and you don't feel crummy. You actually feel good because you connected with someone. So how motivated are you to actually go back and try to do something again, right? So it's about trying to figure out the right level of task that you can be successful. I don't want you guys to teach your brain to fail. And we see a lot of that where people are trying so hard to recover, and they just keep doing things that are either too hard or they're not the right thing for them and failing and failing. And then they just get so discouraged or they get anxious or depressed. It's about trying to find the right level of challenge so you can be successful so that you can go to the next level. Intensity matters. The brain does not change without hard work. So you do have to do exercises with repetition as well. Repetition and intensity. If you are doing stuff that you're already good at, that's not hard, it's not necessarily going to change your brain. If you do stuff that's too hard, it's not going to change your brain for the better either. So it really is sort of the Goldilocks and the three bears. It's about trying to find the right level of challenge, not too hard, not too easy, and doing it repetitively for your brain to learn. So this is my new thing that I've been talking to patients about the right level of challenge. So this circle represents everything you used to be able to do before your brain injury. And for many of our patients, this is extensive. They were parents, they were working, they maybe volunteered, they maybe looked after their parents as well. Um, they have hobbies, they have things they like to do, they took care of their house, all sorts of things. We all lead very busy lives. This might be represent what they can do now right, successfully. So their, their abilities are often significantly restricted after their injury. We have some people that try to do everything they used to be able to do and it's not going all that well, right? Or they can do it one day and then they're in bed for three days. So really, if you want your brain to improve, what you need to start doing is more of this. A little bit more than you can do. And we call, I like to call that the zone of therapeutic benefit. So if you stay in this red area, that is the area that makes your brain change for the better. If you go out back into the green, particularly close to the edge of the green, that's not necessarily going to make you better because you're doing stuff that's too hard. It's like if you were in grade 10 and I came in and started teaching you university level math. More likely, are you going to learn anything about math? Probably not because it's too hard. Are you going to want to come to math class? Are you going to sign up for math? Do you like math? Probably not because you're going to be discouraged, right? You're going to think you're dumb and you can't understand it. But if I come in as your teacher and teach you grade 10.1 math, and you understand that, then I give you grade 10.2 math, I'm I might get you to university level math, right? But it takes a little bit of time, and that's how we try to do it when we're giving people activities. You know, if you find it's hard to look up while you walk, I don't want you looking up and turning your head 10 times while you're walking. That's too steep a gradient, that's too hard. What we're gonna practice first is walking with your head up a little bit, and maybe you'll do that for 10 steps and then look down and we're going to work our way up to starting turning your head. And if you work within that red zone, what we find after time is that what you can do now starts to get bigger, right? You start to be able to do more successfully, be able to take on more things and build your stamina. So the way you can push yourself has to move as well, right? And really our long-term goal, and there's a range of what this looks like for survivors. Some people, this might be their best level of recovery, but some people might be able to get back doing everything they did before, okay? And that's, it varies from individual to individual in terms of what their level of recovery is. I like to put these books up because these are really great books. There's a, um, a physician called Norman Deutsch and he wrote two books. The one on the left is his first book that talks about neuroplasticity. It's written for the layperson. Having said that, it has got science terms. It's not you know, it's not a novel that's the easiest read. Um, and then the second book is more different ways of, more innovative treatment ways that are on the cutting edge of neuro, neuro rehab. Okay, and um, if you don't even want to read or reading's hard for you, there's a documentary. So you can go to CBC, The Nature of Things, and they did a one hour documentary on the brain's way of healing, on the more on the second book that he shows some of the things. Okay, Kelly saw me, we're gonna have a break. So we're gonna come back at quarter after. 10 to, we'll come back at quarter after so if you guys can take a break and we'll meet you back here at quarter after seven yeah
Okay, so let's get started again, because now we're going to get into all the good stuff. So here is a not exhaustive list of common symptoms that you can see after brain injury. So you can see there's a lot of different symptoms. So certainly it's not everything, but these are some of the more common ones that we see after injury. So headache being one of the biggest ones, dizziness, light sensitivity, noise, fatigue, cognitive changes, trouble with your balance, sleep changes, difficulty reading, difficulty with screens. We have a lot of people struggle with computer screens or phone screens or TV screens. Uh, anxiety and depression we see quite commonly. Uh, exercise intolerance. So this is more if you go to walk or do some physical exercise that increases your symptoms and you have difficulty with that. Um, trouble with multitasking, uh, word finding problems, the brain fog, or people just report feeling out of it or in a fog, difficulty paying attention, difficulty with memory, and overall that fatigue, that reduced physical and cognitive stamina for tasks. So these are some of the more common ones that we see after an injury. Um, and we're going to talk about not all of them, but some of these strategies that we talk about will help you across, across more than one. So our first strategy always, always, always at Parkwood is we start with planning and pacing. And we have our pacing graphs, and we've actually just changed these. So you guys are the first audience to see our new and slightly improved pacing graphs. So this is what, if you initial, initially after the injury is what usually the recommendation is. You have the blue line that says symptom onset. That's where if you feel your headache or dizziness or fatigue, when you're initially within the first one to four weeks post-injury, you ideally want to stay below symptoms. If you feel symptoms, you want to stop. You know, that's your brain telling you that's too much at that time. Um, and you try to do some activity. The purple line here is your, um, the level of activity you do. And you can see it's not that you do something all the time. We often recommend maybe for 15, 20 minutes, do something, then take a break. Or we'll say do something physical, then switch to something cognitive, right? So early on, you're a little bit, uh, it's okay to do stuff, but you want to really try to stay below the level of the symptoms. For about 80% of the people, that works well. They get back to everything they did, and they don't have any issues. But some of our patients end up looking more like this. So this may ring true for some of you. And so this is, again, when your symptoms come on, you're either symptom-free or your symptoms are under control, right? So some people will sometimes always have a headache. They're never symptom-free, where some people are symptom-free. Your activity is you keep going because you got stuff to do. It's not very convenient to have a brain injury. I've got to, you know, clean my house, take my kids places and drive and do all these types of things. And I start to have a headache or something that comes on, but I still have more things to do, like get the groceries, come home and make dinner, put the groceries away and start the laundry. And then I reach a point where I'm just exhausted. My head is so bad or I'm so fatigued I can't do it, so I collapse into bed. And I might stay there for a night or I might stay there for three days, depending on how much activity I did and how bad I feel. But finally, I start to feel a bit better, but now I'm behind, so now I better get caught up. I've got to really go get more groceries because the kids have been eating me out of house and home, and now I'm behind on my cleaning my bathrooms, and I have to go to a soccer tournament with my kids, and then I crash again. So we see a lot of people that are doing this even years out after the injury, and it's not really working very well for them, but they just haven't figured out how to do it any differently. And what we want people to do is this. We want you to alternate what you do we want you to change your task, and we want you to try to stay out of these significant symptoms. You don't have to stop at the first sign of a twinge of a headache or anything like that. You do need to push and make it a little bit challenging for yourself, but really, you want to stay on the mild to moderate symptoms, right? So if you start to go try to challenge yourself to be on the computer and read on the computer, if you're reading for 10, 15 minutes, you're noticing your headache's gone from a 1 to a 3, let's change tasks. Let's go do something physical. Go have a cup of tea, maybe sort some laundry. Sit and listen to something. See if you can get that headache settled back down again. Once it's settled back down again, then maybe you can read or maybe you can go for a walk, right? You're not going to go for a walk for an hour and need, your headache goes from a 2 to an 8 and then you have to come back and lie down for 2 hours to recover. That's not productive. That doesn't make you your brain heal and do better, right? It's okay for your headache to go up a little bit, but you need to be able to settle it down in 30 to 60 minutes, okay? So this is what it looks like you need to try to get your activity under control. And this is hard, 
And it's not always convenient because like I said, people have things to do. But if you don't do this, this is what you stay like. Good days, bad days, insignificant symptoms. If you start to do this, then you start to look like this. You can do a lot more for a lot longer. You might be able to stay in the green or you might still have some symptoms, but you can still be productive and do a lot more. So every patient is different, every individual is different, so it just depends what your level of recovery and what things look like for you. But ideally we don't like to see people up here. Because the problem is if you're living up in your significant symptoms, it's really hard to do rehab, right? If, you've got, if you're sealing down and where your symptoms are, your headache is always an 8 out of 10, you've got nowhere to go to be able to push yourself to do more and be able to recover. So I always find if I'm trying to train someone and they haven't paced and plan, I need them to see someone like Becky to get their schedules in order and get their, their activity cut back a little bit so that their headache or whatever is more well controlled so I can give them a balance exercise or a vision exercise and they can actually do some repetitions that's required to change the brain to heal and improve that task. So if you're busy trying to do everything you've always done, you need to start thinking about things a little bit differently. Ideally, we have to try to settle those symptoms down a little bit with pacing and planning, but then you start to have to build yourself and build your exposure, right? So it's okay to not go to Jack Astor's on a Saturday night at six. Maybe you're gonna go for brunch somewhere, right? And let's, we are gonna give you some strategies of how you're gonna be able to do that. You're out of the rest phase, right? After a month, or even they think even after two days to three days, rest is not that useful anymore. It doesn't mean that you go back to everything you've always done, but just resting and hoping your brain will heal is not, not where you guys need to be. You need to do graded activity at a level that you can handle. You have to think about that zone of therapeutic benefit. Think about how quickly your symptoms come on, Think about how long it takes to settle them back down. And our general rule of thumb is you can have your symptoms go up by 2 to 3 out of 10, dizziness, headache, whatever that symptom is, but you need to settle it down within 30 to 60 minutes. Again, general rule of thumb that we use. And when you're talking about increasing activity, you have to look at a few different areas. You can look at cognitive. You need to challenge yourself to do things that require your attention, your memory, problem solving. You need to look at cardiovascular or physical. You need to go for a walk. You need to get your heart rate up a little bit. You need to, you know, lift things and move through space. Uh, environmental. You have to expose yourself to light and to noise in a graduated way that you can handle so you can build your tolerance for these things. Um, cognitive, you got to try reading, you got to get on the computer a little bit. Sometimes we hold off, it's something, if you instantly get symptomatic, sometimes we leave that and come back to it after we build some other skills. You need to start planning some meals, right? And you need to have some things in your back pocket that you can do that are restful that help you settle your symptoms down. Mindfulness, we like listening tasks like podcasts or audiobooks or music. You know, have something that makes you feel good, a bath or a shower, you can do some coloring or cuddle your pets is always a nice way to help your symptoms settle down if you have them. And ideally we're trying to increase your stamina for task and make things harder as you go along and as you progress. The first thing you want to do is try to quiet some of that noise in your brain, right? You need strategies to keep the symptoms down and we have some things that are our most favorite. Our most favorite is mindfulness and this is our favorite app for mindfulness. It's called Calm. You can download it for free on Android or iOS. And it has some guided meditations that are 3, 5, 10, 15 minutes long. We often recommend starting for 10 minutes and do it regularly. If you have trouble falling asleep because your brain is whirling, listen to Calm. If you have do this in the morning or when your headache comes on, you can do, we have patients that will drive to the grocery store, do five minutes of Calm, go into the grocery store, right, and then come back out again. Palming is this picture on the uh, right, covering your hands. Because if I close my eyes, I can actually, with the light, I can still see some shadows if I wave my hands in front of it. And that's still light that's getting in through my eyes into my brain. And so many of you may find that resting in a dark room is your favorite place to be when you have a headache. But you can give yourself a small temporary dark room without lying down for an hour where you cup yourself, cup your hands over your eyes and cover your eyes and relax and do 10, 20 breaths. And my patients tell me that this helps them bounce back. So particularly if they're doing some visual tasks or cognitive tasks, they'll stop, they'll do 10, 20 breaths with their eyes cupped and they feel like they bounce back faster. So they're likely to be able to do some more repetitions. 
Coloring is often a good one. It's sort of a form of mindfulness. You have to be careful. There's lots of adult coloring books, but many Many of them are very intricate and very visually stimulating. So some, some of our patients do better um, with more kids coloring books or finding a simple, like I just pulled this one off the internet, a simple coloring page that's not so visually busy. Um, and sometimes you can think about reducing the stimulus, right? There's a reason we don't have all the lights flaring overhead for you guys. We turn them down because we know that you don't like that. Um, think about noise. So if you're starting to do a cognitive task, don't have any noise in the background and work towards having noise in the background. We also really like listening tasks for downtime so that you're not sitting staring at a blank wall going crazy because that's going to make you depressed. Um, but doing something like listening to a podcast, TED Talks are great. They're 10 to 20 minutes long. You can sit, listen to a TED Talk on a podcast and, and go out from there. Audiobooks are often good as well. Addressing the sleep is really critical. And the first thing is sleep hygiene. So um, there's lots of, of sleep hygiene advice on the internet, but these are some of the highlights, which is you try to go to bed and wake up at the same time. Have a bedtime ritual, just like you did it when your kids were babies, right? Bath, sleep, right? Story, bed. Um, you want to make your bedroom a haven for sleep. Don't have your phone there or turn everything off. Make sure, you know, your shades are drawn. There's no extra light coming in. It's quiet so that when you go to bed, you just go to bed to sleep, not to watch TV, things like that. Um, watch your caffeine after one o'clock and think about, you know, caffeine from things not just from coffee, but Coke or chocolate or different things, tea, green tea, things like that. The other thing that's important to help regulate your sleep-wake cycles is to get some morning light. So make sure get up, get out in the sunshine in the morning to help stimulate your body's own um, sleep-wake cycle properly. So that's a really important thing. Exercise very much can help people sleep, but not if you do it really close to bedtime. So you want to not do it right before bed, but having regular exercise will help with sleep. And for some patients, napping is not advised, but some patients do need to nap. And But the napping should not be a three-hour nap in the afternoon. It shouldn't be an hour in the morning and two hours in the afternoon. We like 30 to 60 minutes nap um, if you need it. And some people don't do it every day. They might do it every other day, and that's all they need. So the big thing about napping is you don't want it to disrupt your bedtime sleep. So if you can get away with a nap and still fall asleep okay at night, that's all right. Mindfulness before bed is another good strategy. Oh, yeah, that's on this slide. So some patients have done things like melatonin or magnesium, and that can help with sleep. Um, and there's some apps uh, like Sleep Pillow that has sounds that are kind of relaxing, um, or a calm sleep story. So these we quite like. I'm going to play you one. So this is literally like a bedtime story for grown-ups. It's fantastic. And it's not going to let me play it. Huh. Okay. This is what it sounds like. Don't fall asleep. Right? So it's hard to stay asleep when she, or stay awake when she's talking to you. So for those of you, if your mind is spinning at night and have a hard time settling down, listening to something like this where it distracts you and just settles you down into sleep can be helpful. Some of our patients have been liking the sleep sounds. So I just YouTube sounds for sleep and you can find music like this. And so you have eight hour or 45 minutes, stuff like this that some people find listening to helpful. Um, similar to the short, the getting morning sunshine, if that's hard for you, you can do their shortwave blue light. There's a little bit of research saying that that shortwave blue light, you can do a burst in the morning and a burst after lunch. That can help regulate your sleep weight cycle. Some of our patients also find amitriptyline is a medication that's helpful if they have sleep and headache. That's often one of the first lines of defense. So you could ask your doctor about that. And usually our, our physicians start people at 10 milligrams daily and go up by 10 milligrams as tolerated. But it's a, generally a low dose that you don't need it. We have some patients that have done a weighted blanket and found that helpful as well to settle their system down. If those are more the people who have trouble staying asleep do a bit better with a weighted blanket. Noise sensitivity is a really not very nice symptom. And if those of you that experience noise sensitivity, you realize how much you need to be able to tolerate noise to leave your house and interact with people in the world. So we have a couple strategies. Some are for 
coping. So these are the coping. What can you do to survive the noise sensitivity? So we really like musicians' earplugs. So this Alpine one on the right, you can buy those online for, I think, $35 or $40. And they have different levels of filters. So if you're going to watch your kid's hockey game, you can put in the strong filter to block out more noise versus if you maybe are having someone over for coffee, you know, or meeting someone for coffee, you could do a lower level filter. These are better than earplugs because some sound gets through, but it filters out some of the background noise. So people find that that's better and more comfortable. If you're really noise sen sensitive, then for many people, it's worth the investment in the Bose noise canceling headphones. So these are about, I think they're up to about $375. Um, but these are life changing for many of our patients. So not only does it um, filter, it not only does it block noise, but it actually dampens the noise down actively. So we've seen people's really people people really turn around and be able to get out and do things. Because if you are staying home and not doing anything because you are so noise sensitive, um, that's not good either, right? We use this to get out of your house and start to re-engage in activities again. But really you want the noise the, the earphones not so much in your house unless you have a bunch of kids running around or it's really noisy, but more when you're out in the environment. But in the meantime, you need to build tolerance, right? So if you want to reduce your noise sensitivity, you have to expose yourself to noise. And this often gets worse before it gets better because for many of our noise sensitive patients, this is really challenging. Again, you don't put noise in your environment for two hours. You might start for five or 10 minutes. You try to find something that's comfortable that you can handle and survive five to 10 minutes and you start to build your tolerance from there. We often do very low level and we often just do one earbud in the right ear, low level rain noises or music or spa sounds, whatever's comfortable for you uh, and try to get your brain used to processing sound. We have some patients that have found the Gregorian chants really helpful. Let's see, this one's working. Um, and they find it really soothing. So this is an example of that. So that's when there's something about the, <laughs> okay, there's something about the Gregorian chant that actually can help modulate your brain because it's sort of a little bit on and off. It's not that steady stream. There's something very soothing about the tone that our patients can handle. Um, Calm and Sleep Pillow, again, are apps that have sounds. Our, one of our other favorite ones is Study, which is the one in the yellow and black. And that's a, that is sound that's supposed to help focus your attention. So this is what this one sounds like. So that's a binaural noise that many of our patients have given us really good feedback. Even some of my most noise sensitive patients <laughs> have actually found it helpful. But again, it's finding what works well for you. If you want to start building your tolerance for being out in the environment, there's a great app called Coffativity where it simulates the sound of a restaurant. Right? So instead of being in the restaurant environment where you have to do the noise and the sound is hard for you to leave, you can start to build your tolerance at home where you're sort of comfortable and you can handle some things. So it's a good way to start building your tolerance for things, right? Maybe you're doing a cognitive task while you're listening to that noise. Tinnitus is ear, uh, the ringing in your ears. So this is something, that, again, that is uh, common that we see in, in patients, and it's really difficult and annoying. The problem with this is this is noise inside your head, so you need to put noise in your environment, external environment, to drown out the noise in your head. So if you're noise sensitive and have ringing in your ears, that's a really tough, tough situation. So we often have people do things like, and it's usually worse for people when they're sleeping because it's quiet and then the, the ring in the ear seems progressively so much louder because it's quiet. So it's about trying to find some noise in your environment. So people will buy a white noise machine, but we've had patients that actually taught us about brown noise and the brown noise is a lower pitch and is tolerated a bit better. So I'm gonna play, maybe, I'm gonna play, this is the white noise. And this is the brown noise. So lower pitch, consistently my patients tell me that this is better for them to listen to when they're doing stuff. Life hacks for reading. So 
uh, again, we don't want you to avoid reading. We want you to start trying to work on reading. And so something like a blinder, which is shown in this picture, is that covering up what you have to read. So instead of looking at a page where your brain takes in all the all the visual stimulants, even though you're only reading one line at a time, dampen down how much your brain has to take in. Have a have a cardstock or something and cover up and sort of just move it down the page as you're reading. It'll help your eyes be on the right line and help decrease the amount of noise coming in. Sometimes our patients end up doing like cutting a window out so they have a blinder above and below so as they move down the page they're not distracted. But it tends to be the stuff down below that's more distracting for people. Covered overlays are the picture in the middle. So this is, you can get these at Staples for three dollars. And this is, we have about maybe 40% of our patients find that if we cover whatever the reading material is with this colored filter, it's more comfortable. So we, some patients, it doesn't matter, but we usually will, if you come to see us, we cover it up and see, put, put a blue over and see, do you like that one? Do you like yellow? Do you like pink? So there's certain people like blue, certain people like yellow. You just find which one makes the information easiest and more, more comfortable to go into your brain, and you use that for when you're reading. Right? So that you're just anything that makes it more comfortable. We also recommend that people set a timer so that when you don't sit down to read, you don't wake, stand up, you know, 30 or 45 minutes later when you have a screaming headache. Sit down and read for 15 or 20, whatever is your brain can handle that you know you're not going to have a screaming headache at the end of it. By nasal occlusion I'll talk about next. Um, larger font is often useful, right? So some of our patients find the small font is trickier, so you can always increase the font if you can on your computer or find some large print books if you need to. The other thing is that grade it down. Remember your grade 10 math brain? Maybe you need a grade 10 book brain. So maybe you need to read, we often recommend young adult books instead of complex things. So find a simple story, start with short stories, maybe start with magazine articles instead of maybe a big, rich, thick novel that might be hard for you to follow. Um, I always like to talk about the little app glasses. So that's uh, on your phone where it will just magnify something. So um, as you're older, 40 perhaps, you may find that sometimes it's hard to read, so you can use that for menus or uh, children's medication bottles so you don't poison your children. You can increase that font so you can see it. <laughs> that's come in handy for me. So binary occlusion is one where we put tape on the inside of people's glasses that they already have or on empty glass frames. Um, and we might put it on straight or where it's narrow at the bottom where the nasal portion is. Um, and I, there's a YouTube video on our St. Joe's website of me talking about how you do that. So if you haven't tried it, I recommend you check out the video and, and see if you can try that. And do it with your reading. So read something. Put the tape on the glasses or, and see if it changes how you're able to read. Uh, and we often find patients that can read with less headaches, they read faster, they understand what they read. Um, because it really decreases that visual noise, it helps the eyes work together a bit and improves the efficiency of the, of the visual efficiency and how the brain performs. So I'm going to play a quick video. Uh, this is actually my kid Muddy who uh, got concussed. Um, and so he got, of course, the glasses on on day one, and you can hear his reading with and without the glasses. I believe Harry is a kid in the backfield. He knew the lesson was wrong, but I think it's starting to get a little out of control. Many played soccer this spring, and his team stunk. They never got a single goal, and the other team scored at least 10 times. Okay. It so you can see he reads faster, and he reads easier, and he's less hesitant. And we see this commonly with our patients as well. So we usually recommend it for things like reading, TV, computers, or driving, but some people find they also like it when they're walking around. Some people don't like it when they're walking around, but you can try it and see what works for you if it does. In terms of computer screens, there's a few little tricks that we use, one of which is called f.lex, which all of us should use anyways. It's a free download, and it's the bottom right-hand picture and what that does is it takes out the short wave blue light out of our screens. And so it makes it usually, that makes it much more tolerable for people uh, post-brain injury. So you don't realize, especially at night, how bright your screen gets. So this one gets um, a little bit darker and more yellow as the night goes on. And you can see the difference in the screen before and after. 
And similarly, the iPhone has what's called the night shift. And if you don't know how to use it, you can talk to Becky or I at the end and we'll show you how to do it. But this is a setting you can put on your phone. Instead of it being sort of icy blue, it warms it up and makes it more yellowy. And again, many of our patients find that much more comfortable to be able to read the screen. So that's available for iPad and, um, and uh, iPhone. Uh, if you have an Android, you need to download a blue light filter. And I actually don't have an Android, so I don't know which one to use. But I think there's a there's an options there. Some patients find that glasses with tint are helpful. So some of our patients have been to optometrists and got prescription lenses with tint or with blue blockers, and they find that's a bit more helpful when they're having to do computer screens. Um, the other thing is on your phones and tablets, and uh, you can do something called Reader View, which will take away all the ads and make a website that you're reading much more simple. So even that simple thing can make a big difference. And you can also do that online for an app uh, there's different apps that do that, but the one I know about is called Pocket, where if there's a website you want to read, but there's apps and stuff popping up, you can forward it to Pocket, and you can read it, and it's just the text, and it's a, it's a very flatter, easier to read text, so it takes away some of the visual noise. Dizziness. Uh, we don't want people to avoid movement. You have to do stuff that will make you dizzy, but you want it to be a little bit more dizzy. Right? And the key that I tell my patients is that every repetition you have to let the dizziness settle before you go on to the next one. If you do 10 repetitions and you don't let it settle, then you stand up and you completely feel awful. But if you do one, you come up, you let things settle, you go on to the next one, right? Grade 10 math. 10.1, 10.2, you work your way up, let your brain solve the problem, right? You have to start to introduce movement, right? You have to do the things that you've been avoiding that make you dizzy, but you do a little bit. Don't turn your head side to side really fast. Do one way, come back to the middle, let it settle. Turn the other way, come back to the middle, let it settle. Bend halfway over when you're emptying the dishwasher, stand up, let it settle, right? So you can do those repetitions to help reduce that. If you're having persistent dizziness, there's uh, looking, finding a physiotherapist who does vestibular rehab can be very helpful. Or so you may need to see a doctor to rule out if there's nothing else going on. Exercise is really important, again, same principle, start gradually, right? I have people start on five-minute walking programs and eventually get to 40-minute walking programs. But don't start at 40 and go to bed for two days, right? Figure out when you need to start gradually and do it consistently, right? The brain responds to structure and consistently. So I usually tell my patients five to six times a week. And if you have any concerns about exercising, again, you might need to see your physician to give you the thumbs up to exercise if you have any concerns. If you're having trouble with your balance, Practice balancing. Can you stand on one leg? Can you stand with your feet in a straight line? Can you walk in a straight line? Can you walk and turn your head? Can you practice walking down the stairs instead of hanging on for dear life? Can you just slide your hand along the railing? Can you do one finger? Can you have it hovering? Can you figure out a way to challenge your balance? Can you stand with your eyes closed and not fall over? Some of our patients have found a weighted compression vest very helpful. So this is a video of someone going up and down the stairs. And she's young, and she almost made the Olympics for swimming, so she should be able to go up and down the stairs, right? But you can see she's dragging her foot. She's going really slowly. She's sort of feeling with her feet because I'm mean, and I don't let her look at the stairs and look at her feet when she's doing it. So then we put a weighted compression vest on her, and then this is what she does right away after. So for certain, again, for some patients, this can be a big improvement in their balance and anxiety. So we use it for patients that have difficulty with balance or are anxious. Those are the two patients that we often will try the best with. Um, and we sell those at Parkwood um, after patients have seen us. We'll try it with them, and then they can buy them if they, if they want. All right, I'm going to pass it on to Becky now that I've stopped all the time. Okay. We have to. No. Okay, so no, Becky's going to go. We're not going to take a break. Okay, so I am going to talk to you about a little bit more maybe home life strategies with some of your tasks that you're doing at home. Um, the first thing is, is a lot of our patients complain or comment on how difficult it is to remember everything they have to do. We live in a very knowledge-filled, busy, busy world. So trying to keep everything that we need to do, have done, remember to bring with us, up in our brains is hard after an injury. So one of the first things I recommend is that you need to get a system of some sort. I don't care what the system is. It could be pencil and paper. It could be a planner, like a schedule planner. It could be 
a phone, it could be a tablet. It just has to be something that's consistent and reliable that you go to as your kind of place where you can dump everything out of your brain into it and has it as a reliable source. You also need to refer to the system very often. So don't just look at it in the morning and say, oh, I'll remember everything for today. Go back to it throughout the day. Even review the night before to see what's going on the next morning. I also recommend that if you have to do things on a regular basis, trying to, let's say, take medication on a regular basis or at a certain time of day, pair it with something you do in your everyday routine already. So if you always brush your teeth at 8 o'clock in the morning and you take 8 o'clock meds, then that would be a great thing to pair together. So keep your meds near your toothbrush and then you'll always remember them. Um, I also recommend that if patients have long lists of to-do items or lists of things they're always trying to remember to bring with them, like a packing list for camping or packing their suitcase, take that list and laminate it. Now you have a dry erase marker and you can check things off as you go. And you always have that list with you, leave it in your suitcase. Is it down or over? If your memory is not reliable as well, we want to try also to try and keep as many things with us as possible. We need to write it down. So does anyone ever have the moment in bed right before you fall asleep? You're like, oh, yeah, I have to remember that for tomorrow. Have a notebook beside your bed. Write it down and look at your notebook the next morning. That way you don't forget it and that way you're not stewing about it or perseverating all night about trying to remember it. As a last resort as well, my, one of my favorite tips is to leave a note in your car because it's usually the last place you're going to be before you have to take off, and then for sure, for sure, you won't forget your item. I also re recommend that you people keep things, like things together. So for instance, if you always bring your lunchbox to work, put your work keys in your lunchbox. That way they always go together and they're always with you. Try to have a place in your house for everything and everything goes in its place. This could take some time to set up. It could take some time to build that habit. If you always used to leave your keys on the counter and now you wanna put them in a basket somewhere, then it takes about 21 days to get used to that habit of putting your keys in the basket. But you will eventually get there. If you practice over and over and over again, then, and maybe even leave a note on your counter saying, the keys have moved. They've moved to a basket now. It, as well, if you are trying to organize your house, if you're trying to, uh, let's say, empty a closet out or empty out your basement or reorganize some of your items in your house, if your items usually had a home base, I recommend leaving a note in the old home if you've moved it to a new home. That way you can look at it next year when you go look for your mittens and hats again. And you're like, oh yeah, I moved those. I moved those to a new safe place, which is even better. And then year after year, you'll get used to that new home. When we think about memory and attention, some, a lot of those things revolve around cognition and thinking. So our thinking skills are really important to, to have intact. And it's really important to have those memory and attention activities really in the forefront. So if you're trying to do some stuff, try and reduce distractions as much as possible. If your brain is busy filtering or trying to block out background noise, background stimulation, those kinds of things, if we can just mute the TV, turn off the radio, that will all, all, all of a sudden free up some space in your brain. So you will be able to focus even easier if you take away some of the distractions. Now, not to say we never, like the world is distracting. Right? So we have to build tolerance for those distractions. But if you're trying to fill a really important government form, this is a time that's high stakes. You want to turn off that background noise okay? and put all your focus into it. If you're really struggling, sit down to think. If you can't remember what you had to bring with you to work, have a seat. If your brain is focused on keeping your feet underneath you and balancing, there's not enough room left to think about what you're trying to pack. Right? So sit down to think if you can. It's also a great way of trying to trigger your memory. So if you, as soon as you sit down, you'll jump up again saying, oh yeah, now I know what I have to bring with me. If you are going to really try and hammer home a memory, if you're having a conversation with someone, and you're like, I have to remember this. I don't have my, I don't have my notebook with me. I don't have anything with me to write it down, but I have to remember it. Always think about multi-sensory processing. So try and use all your senses to wrap around that information so you can really retain it for later. So for instance, if someone tells you some information, say it out loud back to them. Repeat it again. If you can, again, take a little notebook and write it down if you have it with you, or put it in your phone quickly, and then review and repeat. So before you leave that conversation, say, okay, before I forget, I just want to make sure I got this information right. So you want me to go to the dentist, 8 o'clock tomorrow, I got it. And that's a way of kind of reinforcing that in your brain. So you can actually focus your attention a lot more if you repeat it out loud a couple times. 
Some of our patients as well really struggle with trying to do all the things around the house. So a lot of them are multitaskers, doing many things at once. So usually at the very beginning of an injury, I recommend that you try and delegate as much as possible. Try and clear your plate of all those things that you had to do before as much as possible so you can reintroduce them slowly and gradually. You really need to prioritize things, so pick one or two items that are the, the most important. Do you have to wash your toilet every single day? Maybe not. Maybe every other day is enough. Break tasks down to smaller bits. We'll get back to this a little bit later on as well. But take a large task and break it up into easier, more manageable chunks. That's a lot easier to do a small chunk than it is to do a whole task at once. And again, have a list of tasks. If you have a list of things you want to get done, almost like a wish list of to-do things, then when you have some free time, you can always take an item off that list and kind of, it's really satisfying to have a little scratch mark through that item or to have a little check mark beside it as well. If you haven't tried meal planning yet as well to help with your home life, then we'll get back to this in a couple minutes, but now is the time to start. So if you haven't done it yet or if you've kind of fallen off with doing it, it's time to come back to that meal planning thing. I have some patients who have older kids and they're like, well, I used to meal plan all the time when I had my young kids. Now that they're older, I don't need to do that anymore. And I say, well, let's get back to it because it worked then, so it's going to work again. We have a lot of patients who want to do all or none. So a lot of their tasks are, if I can't do it all, and all in one day, I'm not going to do it. Um, so again, with that, that's not really going to make us better either. If, we, if we're not doing anything, we're not going to heal and you know, get better at the tasks we're trying to get back to. So a lot of people are procrastinating or not doing some tasks because it's almost like a mountain of activity that they have to get done. Um, one of the favorites is paperwork. So if you have that big pile of bills or paperwork you have to file away in your office, um, a lot of people put that off. And so then it becomes two years worth, then it becomes three years worth of papers or income taxes and those kinds of things. So I usually recommend with things like that, I say, can you set a timer for 10 minutes and do that paperwork for 10 minutes? That's all we're asking. Not a huge commitment. People are like, I can do 10 minutes. And so you've done 100% of that chunk, of that 10 minutes worth. Or could we do one inch of that stack of papers? And after a little while, that stack of papers will be gone again, right? So if we can do a little bit at a time, we can have 100% success with that little chunk. And it's very satisfying to, again, check that off your to-do list or scratch it off and say you did it. Okay? If your goal, your goal is to have to complete the one portion. So if you look at the little graph here, if you want to complete the red the red portion, you have 100% success if you completed that chunk. It's not the whole thing, but it's that chunk. So to get back to meal planning. So we talked about meal planning earlier. I have a lot of patients who this just takes the stress away. This helps with grocery shopping because now you have a list that's been formed for your grocery shopping that you need to get done. This takes away all the thinking that happens on a daily basis of what you're going to make for supper because you've done the thinking all at one time and you've made the decision early on in the week before you went shopping, and now you have all the ingredients, you have everything you need to do, and all you have to do is follow your list when you get home. It's really important though to schedule some quiet time to do your meal planning, so don't try and do this as you're in the parking lot of the grocery store, because you're trying to rush at that point. So really try and schedule some quiet time to do this, maybe in the evening before you go grocery shopping, even not even the day of. So you can do it at a different time when you're not rushing so much. I usually recommend that you use an a meal planning sheet of some sort. This is one of my favorites, the eat sheet. Um, so this has the meal planner on one side and the grocery list attached to it. If you want to get really picky about it, you can do the Becky method of grocery shopping or grocery list making, which is write down your items in your grocery on your grocery list as you would travel to the store. So imagine what your store looks like and write them as you would go through the store. So the produce is always at the front, then you hit the bread and the meat the back, and then you hit the aisles afterwards. Okay, so know your grocery store and try and stick to the same one if you can, because then you get familiar with where things are until they move everything on you. And then you have to find it all over again. Do not try and fill out this sheet though when you are grocery shopping. Your brain is already busy enough trying to stand up, trying to push that cart, and trying to filter out the noise, the lights, the colors, the shapes, the movement, all that stuff. So your brain is on overload already. It can't take another task on. Okay, so meal plan ahead of time at home in your quiet, humble abode. So here's how you do it when you're, when you're going to get back to meal planning. First, you're going to choose which meals you want to make. And this could be a good time to maybe recruit some volunteers, ask the kids, ask the spouse, ask anyone really for recommendations of what to make for meals. This may also be a good time to choose the Friday night pizza night so you can have a takeout dinner, make it a little bit easier on yourself. It's also a good time to check the freezer. You may already have some 
stuff in the bottom that you haven't looked at for a little while. So you might want to take some inventory. As you're making your meal plan, you want to write down the ingredients you need or the items you need to buy at the grocery store. Again, a good time to check the cupboards. I have some patients who buy a bottle of mayonnaise every time they go out because it's on sale, and then they have 10. So unless you're making a lot of potato salad, you don't need that much mayonnaise. When you go to the grocery store, I don't know about you guys, but I like to buy my shampoo and soap there too. So if that's not really a food item to make with a meal, but you want to add that to your grocery list too, that would go at the bottom of the list in the pharmacy section of Becky, the Becky grocery list system, okay? And bring the list with you. Who makes a list and leaves it at home? I do, I do. So if you find that you do tend to do that a lot where you leave the list at home, then your phone is usually always with you. Take a picture of it with your phone. If you want to get really fancy, make it now your lock screen photo so that you don't need to unlock your phone every time you have to look at your list. It's just there on top as soon as you touch the phone. When you're at the grocery store, we need you to survive the grocery store. This is a busy, busy environment, okay? This is probably one of the hardest places to go, especially the Costco. So the first thing I recommend is if you're light sensitive, wear a hat because that will help cut down some of the lights coming from above you. You may even want to wear a hat and sunglasses to help the, light, the brightness. Maybe wear the earplugs, wear the noise canceling headphones, wear earbuds that have a little bit of white noise coming through them, or the musician's plugs. Those would be a good, good time to put them in. You can go at the off-peak times. Do not go to Costco on Easter Saturday. That's the busiest day of the year. You will not even find a parking spot there. You want to go on Monday. Costco is Monday, guys because that's the least busy time of the, day, of the week for Costco. Um, I am part of the Sunday club. So I go out Sunday morning at 8 in the morning, and there's no one there. And there's all my Sunday club members as well. So we all go together and we say hi, those kinds of things. So, If you find that driving is hard, when you get to the grocery store, do some mindfulness before you head into the grocery store. So the drive took enough out of you, let's recharge the battery a little bit, and then head in and get our groceries in the cart. You want to try again, make your list ahead of time, so don't try and do this, and, try and, and don't be changing that list when you're in the grocery store, okay? You want to stick with the list you've already chosen, even if something's on sale, so try and resist it if you can. If you really struggle with grocery shopping, if you can't do the store at all, there's always these lovely things called click and collect now, so Loblaws does this, where you can shop online, you tell them when you're gonna come and pick it up, and you drive in, and they load it in your trunk. So, perfect, good way to go. If you're avoiding the grocery store, and you haven't been there for a while, the first trip back should not be the entire family's weekly grocery shop of the one hour in the store. Try and go in for one or two items, get in and get out as fast as you can, okay? So graded and gradual. Start small and work your way up to a bigger shop. And if all else fails, hire someone or get someone else to go for you, okay? You can release the reins of grocery shopping as well and let other people go in your place. Um, I can't vouch for their accuracy or their sale item capabilities, but you could have some good success because you might not be so symptomatic and it might be worth every penny you didn't get on a price match. With grocery shopping, it's very hard. However, social events are also very hard for patients. Patients really struggle with trying to navigate a busy environment with lots of people, lots of conversations, lots of noise. So it's so important that you guys socialize with people, get together with your family and friends, and do those events. But we may need to tweak how you do those events so you can survive them and not be too, too wrecked by the end of it. So one of the first things I recommend is go in rested. Don't try and plan multiple things in a row and expect to have a good time at your social event if you've done things maybe three days in a row where they've been very, very busy. So try and have a down, a down day or plan some time off before the event. Also plan for a recovery time afterwards. You will be getting symptomatic with these events, so you need to have time to recover from that. The more you do it, though, the easier the recovery time becomes. If you can, arrive late and leave early. Tell the hostess that you're going to be sneaking in and you're going to be sneaking out, but you'll be there. Um, one of my favorite patients, he says, you know, if you're the first person there, you greet everyone as they come in, and then you've seen everyone, so you can go home. Yeah. So you get out on time. If you can, take breaks. Leave stuff in your car. That's the best place to go to take a break. Oh, I forgot that on my car. And then you have to wander out to your car, maybe rummage around for about five, ten minutes, take a little break, and then come back in. The problem is, is if someone wants to have a conversation with you and they follow you out there. So try and go alone if you can. Always triage, triage the environment as well. If you're going to a busy place or a busy event, 
check out where, you know, the ant with the cackling laugh is. Check out where, you know, the kids are playing video games. Maybe don't hang out there. Maybe hang out beside, you know, great Uncle Bobby who maybe is having a little snooze in the corner and he's quiet. Or have people come to you. You set up shop in one chair, people come to you and visit with you instead. Bring your earplugs. If noise is a really hard thing for you, bring your earplugs and wear them. Always remember though, if you put your earplugs in, you are committed to wearing them for the rest of the event. So once they're in, they're in. Don't try and take them out halfway and survive that. It won't work so well. Again, going outside is an option. So again, leaving stuff in your car is really helpful. If you can, let someone else do the driving or drive a separate car so you can leave a little bit early. So if everyone else wants to stay at the party a little bit longer and you need to get out, then drive yourself and then you can maybe have a little bit of mindfulness before you head home. But no matter what, you guys have to try and socialize and stay connected to people because that's what gives us resilience and gets us back on our feet again. The last thing we're going to talk about is return to work planning. Um, return to work planning can be quite complicated. There's usually a lot of players involved with, re with returning to work. It could be a disability insurance provider. It could be a physician or a specialist. It could be human resources, occupational health and safety. There's lots of people at the table. Okay, so you have to kind of communicate with all of them at one point when you're returning to work. And sometimes a therapist can help you navigate that system because it can be quite complex. Um, a lot of times with return to work, it needs to be customized to you. Everyone has kind of a different job. So to try and kind of paint everyone with the same paintbrush doesn't really work. So it's really individualized and your employer will also have a say in what we can and cannot do for accommodations and making things a little bit easier for you as well. One of the key messages for return to work that I usually give is it has to be, just like everything else we've been talking about tonight, graded and gradual. So if we can, start out with a smaller number of hours per day and maybe reduce responsibilities and gradually increase those over time back to your pre-injury state. Be aware that some activities may trigger more symptoms than others. So things like the computer screen or things like noisy environments, maybe those things that you have to be really, really careful of and maybe perhaps use a timer to help with that. So those tasks that are kind of really triggering, a timer might be really helpful to get into those tasks and also your reminder to kind of get out of them when it's been a little bit too long on them. And you can take a little bit of a short break. A lot of our patients, they've tried to do the 50 minute hour. So every, fifth, every hour they take a 10 minute break off of whatever they're doing. Um, again, this is all dependent on if your employer is supportive of this and if you're able to. If you work on an assembly line, it's very hard to just say, click, stop the line, and here's my 10-minute break, because they won't really like that either, right? So it depends on what you're doing for a job. Um, if email is the bane of your existence, and you are always being interrupted by new emails, ping, ping, coming in, then maybe shut the email system off. Put it in your little signature line, and you check emails at 8 in the morning, noon, and 4, and that's it. And then people aren't expecting you to reply to them right away, perhaps. It all depends on, again, what your job is and what you're able to do with that. But sometimes turning off that background distractor can be really, really helpful. If you can, have a signal or if you have a door, close the door when you need to have a little bit of quiet or need to be not disturbed by other people, okay? So some patients wear a hat when they need to be in do not disturb mode. Some of them put up a little sign. Some of them wear a special sweater. Again, it's about communicating with your team members as to what you want as do not disturb. Um, some people put their headphones in, but there's actually nothing attached to the other end, just so it looks like they're busy and they can't, so it, don't interrupt me right now. Um, I also recommend if you have a lunch break, most people have lunch breaks, take your lunch break, don't work during lunch break, don't do email during lunch break, because it's really important to have that time away from your work to recharge the battery, right? So don't be like these guys in the construction site when they're eating lunch on the skyscraper, right? If you can, try and do some mindfulness at work. So again, during your lunch break, perhaps doing a 10 minute mindfulness to help recharge your batteries could be really helpful. Do something relaxing during lunch. So I have a lot of patients who, they take out their knitting needles and they knit during lunch because that's relaxing and it's the way um, to kind of shut down their brain from their work stuff and then they go back to work refreshed and with a little bit more energy. Use your tools. If you need earplugs, if you need that weighted compression vest, if you need that white noise, Bring it with you and use it if you can, because those are what helps you at home, so why wouldn't they help you at work as well, right? And again, maybe perhaps it's about changing some things at work. So could you change some lighting? Could we get rid of the fluorescent bulbs or take out one or two bulbs out of that big bank of fluorescent bulbs and put a different kind of light bulb in there instead? Um, I have some patients who, who live in cubicle land, and what they do is they've bought an IKEA crib cover. It clamps on, it's a big leaf over top of their desk, and they're like, hey, it blocks the light. And now everything has this nice green glow to it. 
But again, they bought that themselves, they put it on, and it's worked great. So sometimes we just need a little bit of ideas to, to bring to the office, and that can help when you're going back to work as well. If you're using the computer, really try and use screen filters if you can. Those colored overlays Shannon talked about with reading, there's usually three of each color in the pack, one for your book, two for your computer screen. Just tape them right on, and they'll work just great. Um, and again, that F-Lux, which is that, that program that runs on the, on the computer to make it a little more orangey colored, that one will also work perhaps at work if your network administrator will allow you to install that. Um, and Night Shift on your phone or tablet can also help. If you can, lower the brightness on your screen. I've had some patients who have figured out how to lower the brightness and change a lot of settings on their computer so the font is bigger. I recommend having a black background versus your family portrait, right? The less busyness on the computer screen, the better. Um, and then trying to clean up some of the icons. If, you're, if your computer desktop looks like it has an icon in every inch, maybe it's time to put some of those in folders or tuck them away somewhere else, okay? You also have to remember when you go back to work, you have another life as well. You have a life outside of work. So if you can, try and delegate some of your tasks that you do at home to others while you're increasing your hours at work. That way you can be successful. You can't be expected to do all of your activities at home that you've been doing plus work as soon as you start, right? So you have to try and, something has to have a bit of a trade-off there. Ask your friends for help if you can. Get some meals made in the freezer before you go back to work. Try and get carpooling done so you don't have to bring your kids to every single practice or game that they have. Um, use your crock pot maybe, or maybe it's you used to have one takeout day in the evening and now it's two takeout days once you return to work until you get your feet underneath you again. Um, don't forget your meal planning. So a lot of our patients, they dump the meal planning as soon as they go back to work. I'm like, hey, that's what helped you at home before, right? So get, get back on that. So that really will really help you as well. You should not have to spend your whole weekend resting and recovering from a work week. Okay, that may mean that you're doing a little bit too much. Maybe we need to back off the hours at work a little bit until you're settled in, and then we can increase them again. So it's, again, slow and great and gradual. Expect your coworkers and people at work to be curious about your injury and ask questions about it. They may want to catch up, see how you're doing. Um, remember, talking is draining, so maybe make it short and sweet. Some patients email their team or email the people at work ahead of time saying, this is my story. Ask me questions if you want, but kind of the details are in there. Some people don't want to reveal anything about their injury at work. So it's all personal preference, so it's up to you what you want to do. Um, some patients go and visit ahead of time. So they go for a lunch break while everyone else is on lunch and just go in and tell them what's going on with them, what they need for help, and those kinds of things to get things set up before they go back to work. People will assume that you are okay because you're back to work, that everything's completely 100% healed and you're all back to normal. So you may still struggle at work and may not, they may not see that struggle because it's an internal struggle. And remember to advocate. It's okay to speak up and say no to things, especially if you used to be on every single committee at work. Maybe don't volunteer for all those things right away when you first start back, okay? Get back to work tasks first and then add those extra things on. Expect an increase in symptoms a little bit. So you will have a mild increase in symptoms. This is normal and natural. Your body will adapt and acclimatize to that new increase in activity. And as you increase your hours steadily, your body will, again, every time you ramp up a little bit, you're going to acclimatize to that new level, and then you're going to ramp up a little bit more, and you will get used to that new amount, okay? So your plan might look straight and narrow, but you're going to have a couple of hills and valleys on that return to work kind of journey. So expect that, and it's totally natural to have some of those happen. If you can practice at home before you go to work, that will make the transition back a lot easier as well. Start building a routine at home. Start getting up at work time. So set your alarm to get up early in the morning if that's what you have to do for work. If your job requires you to use a computer, again, could you start doing more tolerance building at home with computer use? Could you make, organize your photos at home or make a photo book to help build your time on the computer up a little bit? And some patients, again, if it's possible, could you start working from home? Could you kind of remote, kind of link in through your computer and do some work at home first, and then gradually transition back to the office as well? That can make it a little bit easier too. So in summary, with all we said and talked about today, um, you may not be able to do the same things in the same way as you did before, but you can return to meaningful activity. So please keep trying, but again, think of that zone of therapeutic effect. We want to challenge your brain to change your brain. By using the strategies that we've given you tonight, and by really pacing and planning, because we're all about pacing and planning around here, we can certainly get back to those specific activities, we can change your brain, and we can start to see changes in return to those tasks that you want to get back to. 
Okay. So now it's question and answer time. So any questions? We're in time. So any questions from here? I do have, we do have one question online. We've thrown lots of information out at you. Um, does anybody here have any questions? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So the question, the question is, what's the significance of the weighted vest and how does it work? So your balance is controlled by three systems, your vision system, your vestibular system or inner ear, and your proprioceptive system. Um, and when you put the weighted vest on, you increase the signal to the proprioceptive system. And it helps give people where they are in space a bit, because many of our patients don't, they struggle to figure out where they are in space. Right? So with the weight, it has increased sensory input on the feet. The feet knows where you are because it's compressed around your core. It gives their sense of where you are in the middle. And so that's what we think happens with people. So they're able to settle down. Also the compression we also think um, has almost like that hug effect and can help release things like oxytocin for neurotransmitter. Now that's a presumption. That's, that's what we're, you know, there's, there's not research that says that for sure, but that's kind of what we're thinking in terms of why from a balance and anxiety point of view we see a difference. It doesn't work for everybody. Some people put the vest on, they're like, eh, nothing. And other people are like, don't take this off me. I'm taking this home with me right now. So we see a range of how people respond to that. Yeah. Um, so one of the questions online was, is there a way to get rid of the tinnitus? Because they have it all the time and will it ever go away? So that's a tricky question to answer. Tinnitus is a tough one. There's not a lot of good research out there for how to get rid of it. Um, our best thing that we found, uh, sometimes you can go to see an audiologist and you can get some sound generating hearing aids that will actually ding and chime, which sounds annoying, but I had a really, really noise sensitive guy who found it helpful and it helps train it out of your brain. Uh, but besides that, there's not many other great objects. It's really about a lot of our patients' tinnitus is related to their activity level. So for some of our people, once they get their activity level under control and get their symptoms under control, their, their tinnitus will go down. Uh, but there's not a lot of great research for much else. There's one study on uh, transcranial magnetic stim, but that's not, it's only available for research, not for treatment. It can go away. Like it, some people have it just spontaneously go away on its own. Yeah. Or it only comes up when they are flared really bad with symptoms. Yeah. So. Any other questions? Just a general question about uh, the frequency of uh, uh, brain injuries. It seems in society it seems to be just huge. Is there any, why is that so, I guess, and uh, yeah. why is this a lot of post stuff happening to Yeah. So the, the question is, why does it seem like there's more brain injuries? And so I think it's a combination of things. One is an increased awareness, kind of like autism, when they actually started to figure out what it was and correctly diagnose it. So there's a piece of it where I think it's always existed, but it wasn't always picked up before. People just were told to deal with it, or they said they were anxious or depressed. They didn't necessarily link issues to the symptoms. Um, so there's that increased awareness. We always jokingly call it the Sidney Crosby effect, where because when he was one of the first high-level athletes to come out and say, no, I'm not better, and it's because of my concussion. We started to see more athletes and more, more uh, that become more to the forefront because obviously he wasn't faking because what was in it for him to not play. Um, so there's a piece of that. There's a piece of it we don't really know for sure. There's, there's theories out there. One of the things that when I reflect back, I think about how much more time we spend on screens, how much time we spend running around and being busy, what the, you know, there seemed to be an increase in anxiety collectively in the population. So we probably have some pre-existing stuff. There's some interesting research being done on the changes in your gut flora and its impact on things like cognition and mental health. And, you know, so I think it's multifactorial. Um, some of it, people work longer, do, you know, you know, I, I mean, I do more work at home now than I ever did 10 years ago. So, and is that just because I'm older or is that because that's the expectation has changed as we get busier? So, you know, I think part of it is, um, I think part of it is maybe there's an element of people not tolerating going back to working on, you know, we have people sometimes have to get back to two screens or three computer screens, right? And, and, if you, and then the phone's dinging in the background. Right? Yeah. So. so some of it may be the nature of work and some of it may just be better awareness and some of it maybe we don't know. Yeah. Any other questions? We apologize for going over time, but Becky and I always do that because we have lots to say as you can tell we could have talked faster i know have liked that you only knew how slow i was talking i tried okay I tried.
Good luck, everybody. Okay, that's all for today. Is there anything else we need to do in our end here, Kelly? Okay. Okay. Good. Alrighty, so we just want to thank Becky and Shannon for sharing their wisdom with us and these wonderful strategies and, and life hacks. Um, Kelly actually wrote some of them down. She's I did. <laughs> um, I think we should have them come back every year. That's what <laughs> no. we should do. But thank you so much, um, guys, for speaking tonight. Um, if everybody can, there's an evaluation form on the table. And for those watching from home, there's an electronic survey that is sent. If you could complete that for us, that would be great. Um, just a reminder, this webinar has been recorded. And we will be making the recorded webinars um, available on our website. And as soon as we have a location and instructions on how to do that, we will get that to you. So thank you again to Becky and Shannon for presenting tonight. I hope everyone had a great evening.